I think we're set. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know if I was worried about it though, because no, we, can, no. we can steal it from them. No, no, just down here. Yeah, I know, but we can steal it from them instead. Oops. Hello. Welcome to NetMod at 118. For those of you who are in the room here in Prague or online, I uh, appreciate you joining in and hope uh, to have an interesting uh, session and discussion. We have some uh, uh, good dis discussion expected around versioning as well as some new topics. I'm Lou Berger. This is Kent Watson. Online, we should have Jason. We're hoping he's there. He's not there. Uh, I, no, I see yep. him. Yeah. All I'm right. There. Just came in. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so uh, I, we're, we're fully staffed and ready to go. Uh, on this page, you'll see that there's the notes link. We really ask you to join that to help do the collaborative note taking. And this is particularly important for comments made at the mic. So if you make a comment, go in and check that the comment was appropriately captured, the discussion's there so that we don't misquote you and so you feel like your uh, comments are appropriately recognized in the in the minutes. That's really important. The other important thing is please scan in. Um, it's important for those in the room to do that. Uh, if we end up doing any polling, that's how you'll participate. If we when, when we have discussions, not if, but when we have discussions, we're doing a joint queue. Uh, and so we really want people in line for both remote and local so we can appropriately balance the, the discussion. There we go. Uh, what day are we? We're Tuesday. So hopefully everyone's really familiar with the note well already. If you're not, um, we have rules that govern our participation, our contribution to the IETF. Everything you say here, everything you send to the list becomes part of our public record and our permanent record. Um, there's uh, BCPs, best common practices that govern these things. If you're not familiar with them, please join that, you know, go to the note well and read it, become familiar with it. Next. Oh, right. Uh, we also have a code of conduct, which basically governs how we behave here. And it boils down to treating each other professionally and with respect. Uh, yes, we can have heated discussions, but keep it on topic, not about the person. Uh, those of you online, you figured this out already. Um, those in the room, again, please scan, join. Uh, uh, another part that I didn't mention is being listed on the blue sheets that recognizes that you're here, but also helps us get the right room size. So please do that. I think I've covered all of these. Uh, so we have uh, a number of chartered items, uh, including a good discussion on Yang versioning. And we have some non-chartered items this shows the original list. We're actually going to take number eight and move it to the head of the non-chartered items because of uh, conflicts with the speaker's timing with another working group. Uh, we have uh, a number of documents <laughs> in process. Uh, some of them are, uh, so we have one that's sitting that's um, uh, post last call in the um, uh, I'm sorry, submitted to the ISG. We have a number that are post last call and uh, some of them are on the agenda. Others are waiting for author's actions. Um, the first two we're going to hear in just a moment. Um, model versioning, um, we, that's actually also on the agenda. Uh, the only one that's not on the agenda is syslog. Do you want to say anything on that? Well, same status as last time, which is it has a dependency on the uh, uh, IETF TLS client draft, I think, which is uh, currently in a post last call in the NetConf working group. And we hope to uh, have it um, over the line before, I'm hoping, before December. <laughs> um, most of the documents that are not on the agenda were related to versioning and basically are stuck behind the versioning documents. And um, unless someone, one of the authors has something they wanna add, we're gonna move on. I'm not hearing anything. We have no incoming or outgoing liaisons. Uh, 
Uh, as usual, we think it's really important to be able to continue working on documents and making progress on documents independent of these meetings. So that means working remote. So it's not just remote participation in this room, virtually, um, that we want. We want good discussions to continue on list and for uh, ongoing discussions to continue outside. Some of those discussions are uh, informal. Some of those could be formal in the form of interim. Uh, if you have a topic you would like to uh, have the working group uh, uh, focus on, please contact us. An example of ongoing discussion are related to versioning. Those are an example of an informal open meeting. For those who are interested in that topic, you are always welcome to join. Uh, and those meetings are very helpful to continue progress. And um, we'd really like to, to close out on some of these early versioning documents. So if you're interested in the topic, please uh, join those calls. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping the, uh, the uh, slot on there gives you those times. If not, we'll take it to the list. And with that, I think that's my last item. That was your last item. And so we're going to move on to... Uh, Scott. I guess I didn't need to join the queue. <laughs> Speakers do not need to join the queue. <laughs> That's uh, true remote also. Here you go, Scott. Got to stand on the... Ooh, oh, fancy power. Okay, welcome. Um, I'm uh, Scott Mansfield, affiliated with Ericsson, and I have an update on two drafts that are last time I talked about these was back in March. So the status, they've been republished uh, again because they expired because I ran out of time to work on them. And so what we have now are the uh, common interface extension Yang. This work started back 2019 something. And then the sub interface VLAN Yang, which is related and so I've still got some acknowledgements and some uh, just some general cleanup to do on them, but they are hosted on GitHub. So I provide some links to where you can see those, see that work and uh, I'm looking for support and moving these things forward so we can get them across the line. So very simple. The issues from the list have been addressed in the common interface extension Yang. And uh, we still need to understand if anything else needs to be done. I think that that one's at the point where we could do a last call on it and then uh, push it down the push it down the road. The sub interface VLAN Yang has an has an issue in that it references a draft that has long died. So we need to look at that, discuss it on the mailing list, figure out what to do with this with this link if we still need it if we want to change it, and then. Um, get this draft in, uh, in position where I could give a very rosy, you know, helpful uh, status report in uh, at the Australia meeting in March. So for real this time. So I did have a, I did take this on and then uh, fail to complete the work. So this time I've got some time. And so we need to take it to the list, continue the review, push the uh, one draft for last call, if it's if people are willing to do that and then um, consider what we need to do in the one that references the best draft to see if we can get that one moving forward that's it thanks it, it would be great to resolve that open question quickly yes. and then last call both of them at the same time and oh okay get that's a good done, idea get these done okay yeah. let me do that on the i'll do that on the list sounds very good thank you thank you thank you I like that we're moving ahead of schedule. Okay. So, Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Chu Fang. So, this presentation is about the system defined configuration, and the latest version is the 04. I think this work uh, was adopted in last year and to give a very brief introduction, it's about uh, a work to describe how uh, management client and server handle a young module configuration data that is defined by the server itself. So it's, we call system configuration. 
So there are some high level document updates since last ITF meeting. Uh, I think first uh, we have defined a NetConf compatibility identifier for the resolve system parameter. So uh, this is uh, for this update, I feel a little conflict before because um, I'm, I'm, we are thinking before to use uh, the, the client can discover whether a server supports this parameter by reading the young library young library uh, operational information from the operational data store. But we also think that it, this parameter should also be able to be used for the non-MDS servers and those who did not implement the young library. So uh, we choose to use a more generic way, which to, that we say we define a net conf capability identifier so that this uh, parameter the support of this parameter can be uh, defined, can be uh, find, found in the hello message exchange. And the second update is that some consideration for the client to use resolve system parameter uh, has been added. So uh, I think uh, it, um, there was a comment from the working group, which is about how complex, uh, how, how, how how expensive uh, for the server it could be for the server to implement this resolve system parameter because the server needs to resolve the reference during the validation and uh, retrieve the system data store and copy the reference system nodes into running and which might take uh, a couple of rounds because of some error dependency. So here the client should know that it would cost a reasonable amount of time for the server to uh, process this resolve system parameter and they should also keep the connection alive during the server processing. And the third update is that we said in the document that servers may upgrade system configuration as well as any copy system nodes in running when license change or device upgrade. I think we all agree that the, the server should not update running unexpectedly or surprisingly, uh, even when some system configuration change uh, due to some factors like hardware resources update. But I think when it is license change or uh, device upgrade, some system events happen, it might be okay for the server to upgrade uh, the, uh, the node in running as well. But here I, we don't think it should be a mandatory so a mandatory behavior. So I'm just using that the server may upgrade node. Okay, and now we have the two open issues, I think uh, still pending. Uh, the first one is that about the offline validation of running alone, whether that is required. And the second is about the uh, arranging value uh, for the node for the system configuration could be copied into running. I think both issues have been discussed uh, on the mailing list before, especially the first one, but I don't think any agreements have, have been reached. So I have to bring them again. And I think kind of think we can seek some convergence here. So, so about this, uh, First open issue, I post an email to the mailing list a couple of weeks ago. I, I, I feel conflict about this issue because I have to say, um, on the one hand, I appreciate the simplicity of not requiring the referenced system nodes be copied into running. And on the other hand, I do share the concern that we have some lexic clients and existing tools which might heavily rely on the validation of running alone. So as well as the fact that the configuration transformation from running to intended has not been uh, standardized today. So I'm not sure whether, uh, I, so I think Jason and Yan has responded to the email, but I'm not sure whether we must have to standardize this configuration transformation before we remove that requirements. So 
And I'm also thinking, let, let me finish this slide. So, okay. So I'm, I'm also thinking the other way, like if, uh, whether we can um, seek a, co a possible compromise, which is that instead of in explicitly stating in the draft that any reference system nodes uh, must be present in running, can we just state in the draft, like running must always be valid configuration data tree and reference the RFC 8342 and 17915. I'm not sure whether uh, it will work. Okay. okay. Kent as a contributor, <clears throat> that last comment you just made, just simply saying that running must be valid, but without defining specifically the offline valid versus you know uh, server valid, which it's a clever way of allowing the document to uh, proceed um, without us getting stuck on the details of offline validation. Um, that being said, there was a discussion on list uh, you mentioned just uh, three weeks ago, I think. I also replied to it uh, with Jan and Jason. Um, and maybe we need to separate the, the, the question into two parts, right? So there's sort of a, a long-term theoretical as to whether or not running should always be offline uh, validatable uh, alone. Um, and then there's a more near term. Can it be done before Yang next? For instance, like, like if we actually look at the semantics of what were prior RFCs trying to uh, define, is it in line or out of line for us to do it now, or do we have to wait for Yang next? So I'd like to separate the conversation into first, um, like long term, is it always desirable that we running alone must be validatable, um, not not just near term? Okay. Uh, Rob Walton, as a contributor, I wonder whether it'd be worth having a, a, an interim meeting on this specific topic. This would be a useful thing because I think it's, I, I do understand the sort of compromise of trying to get this draft forward uh, and saying less things, but I also see, to Kent's point, that there's an actual issue here. And I'm not sure that sort of skirting around it actually is doing anyone much favors. Right. And given the time, we don't have much time at this meeting. So an interim sounds uh, reasonable. Right. A good idea. Yes. Yes, makes sense to others. So we can have an interim for this open issue. Next slide. You're the clicker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So uh, for this issue, uh, this is about the origin value for the system node copied into running. Because currently, the, the, the draft doesn't limit which origin should be used, whether it's system or intended. But we do have some examples that touch on this point, and, and I do want to know whether this should be clearly defined or we don't have to restrict that. Um, because uh, for the, the previous dis discussion, I think we have some uh, folks think that system should be used, but we also have other folks think we should use intended. But I think I, I, I don't really uh, think intended makes sense for the node if the, the copy system node is immutable because I think this is the case where the configuration in running should not take precedence. And so I don't think intended should be used for this case. Uh, Rob Wilson suggested to say, I think we should specify it. So I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think we should specify it. Okay. And Kent as a contributor. Um, I think here you're trying to decide whether or not we should use system or intended. Yes. But there's also a, a question, is, is there any origin being specified in running at all, right? Because right now, origin is really only being specified in the operational data store, I think. Yes. Um, so th there's really, a the, the first we're saying it, there should be an origin, or maybe there should be an origin that's in running. And then on your previous slide, you had an open issue, or two slides back, you had an open issue as to when we're upgrading server software, right. should the system configuration that was copied in the running also be migrated? Right. right. And, and, and I think that this is uh, connected to that issue because, uh, well, it doesn't have to be, but it would be nice if the origin attribute was being specified in running, then those nodes would get um, upgraded. But if they're not, if they, if they don't have the origin attribute, then they would not get upgraded. Okay. It'd, it'd be a way for that to, um, per, to, to, to be allowed to happen. Yes, I agree. Okay. okay, so I think that's all for my presentation. It's uh, 
it, it's a little frustrating when we don't have time for the good discussion. You're so um, we, uh, but there was one more slide. Yeah. But uh, the, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, but clearly there's interest in resolving these issues, and I think the idea of an interim is a really good one. Um, uh, personally, and I, I'll, I'll wear any hat. Uh, I think it's really important that we give an answer and not sort of slide through the issues because that really, as I don't remember who said it, but it doesn't really help anyone. Um, so if we need an interim to do that, that'd be great. Thank you. So moving on, uh, Oscar. So this is a quick one. Hi, this is Oscar from Telefonica. I'm going to present you the, the, latest of, the latest update of the extensions to the access control region model that we have, uh, that we have done. So uh, we now have been focused on resolving all the open issues that we had from the last ITF. Here you have the pointer to the, to the GitHub where we have all, all of them tracked. And in this one, we have just uh, finished the, the editorial issue. So we had a big problem, problem statement with all the gaps that it's just moved to the to the appendix, and now also it's uh, it's updated with all the the latest young tree, so you can you can see it there. So just the in terms of young, I think with it's quite complete now. So what what have been added? So in the last version we had the uh, ICMP before matching. Uh, now also we have added the option to match this ICMP v6 header, so you can do the v4 and v6. And in order to facilitate the life, we have also included an ICMP v6 IANA maintained module. So we also include the XLS and all the procedure to create this, uh, this module. Also, as, uh, as you know, we included the capability to match with sets. So we also included the capability to create sets with ICMPv4 and ICMPv6 headers. Okay? So you can match against those, those sets. Uh, in addition, uh, also we have added the capability to match IPv6 extension headers, so you can packet match against the routing header or this kind of the IPv6 extension header. Also, to facilitate the life of, of the matching, we have created another IANA, IANA maintained module for this IPv6 extension header, so it has its life on its own with IANA and you can add the, all the extension headers there. And from the list of uh, additional common actions that, that we presented in the last ATF, we just kept the two that were like uh, common across all the implementation and we see that there were no, let's say, they were commonly used and there were no, no controversy just is the, the log action okay so just to, to put uh, to fill a log with the match and counter action that is just to update some counter local counter with uh, uh, upon match upon match action also, there was one comment to add, uh, we had different aliases and we just missed one of them, that was the, the VLAN. So when you received the comment in the last ITF meeting, so, so we have added that, that one. Okay, so at this stage, we think that all the requirements and comments that have been raised around are solved. So for us, all, all the requirements are covered. We, so at least we believe that the document is, is ready from our side for, for going to a working group last call. And we just, want to do a, a, a last check with all you. If we are happy with uh, the current augmentation approach or you still prefer to do an, an, an update and a this version of the current ACL sure, model. Sure. So the cleaner version is always do the, the BIS, okay? Sure. But the pragmatic approach as we have done is okay, based the, to this design based on augmentation. Okay, so just this before just <laughs> going to the, to the desk. A, a clarification question. When you say you want to do a check, are you saying you're checking with the working group well, or the working you, group. you want the authors no, no, to no, do no, a the, check? With the working group. So okay. We already have done the job as per suggestion, going to the augmentation approach and then, hey, see the, how the augmentation are going, how the document got, we did that job. Okay, we have the young with all the augmentation. So now that the young with the augmentation is there, we ask the working group, hey, are you happy to, to keep and we end this work with these augmentations or now with that we have all the, what is needed, put this in the piece. Okay. 
uh, Robleton. Thanks, Oscar. So just for clarifying, uh, clarifying a question, are you saying um, an augmentation as a separate Yang module versus a BIS that, that, that replaces the existing Yang model with the nodes in directly? Is that your question? Or we yes. Just... If, if now we have a module that um, with the augmentations over the base module. And the alternative is a new version of the base module, okay, or the ICL module, including all of the things that have been defined here, not as augmentation, but as part of the, as part of the module itself. So I have no preference. I think it's, in, uh, to, in my mind, it's entirely up to the authors in terms of, and the working group. If nobody has a strong preference, I would continue to do what you're doing now rather than change it. Um, Mahesh, as author of the ACL draft, my preference would be that it be a biz. Uh, can you just repeat the end of your sentence? Your preference is what? I couldn't hear. Uh, biz. Thank you. Sure, we're gonna do a poll, which includes, uh, I, I'm not sure what formulation you're doing it, right? Oh, Sorry. apparently I'm doing it. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm not ready to do a poll, but uh, I thought you were getting ready. The, the, I think the questions is, who's read this? Who thinks the current approach is good and who would prefer a BIS? Now, um, we'll have to figure out how to do that so we include the people online, because it's not fair just doing that. Uh, in, Ken is going to do it. Give us a moment. While we're waiting in the room, how many have uh, actually? I'm going to do this on uh, in in chat. If you've read the document, can you just in chat say that you've read the document? Uh, and if we'll oh, click yes. In oh, the you poll. got it there. Great, thanks. And the next poll, we're going to ask who likes the current approach. So yes means you do, no means change it. Uh, if you don't have an opinion, don't, don't participate. So we actually had good participation on the group on the last one. Um, the interesting thing was we had yes was a, is about a quarter of the room, no was a quarter, and then about half the rooms had no opinion. So I don't quite know what that means. So I'm gonna take it as a quarter of the room have read. Ready. <laughs> so yes means you're happy with their approach, no is you'd like to see a change. Okay, so. But, but no means there, you want to see it as a piece or as a change. I, the person who, I'm not sure if you're willing to share, but could you explain, uh, presumably you read the draft and you do not think it's ready. Could you say why you do not we, think we it's ready? We have Joe in the line, in queue, so I don't, uh, Joe? Joe Clark, it's kind of hard to follow the author, Mahesh, saying he thinks abyss, but for me, I, I was a yes, uh, that I think it's ready because I think the work should progress, but I can see... For me, I think that there's enough use that I might want to use the base module without the augmentation. Um, I think it's useful as it is. I think this adds extra value and I can see additional use cases for this. I would think the BIS would be more real. Uh, the BIS, would, in my opinion, would be more required if in order to get any use out of this, you needed the augmentation as well. And I don't think, I think the augmentation can stand alone. So for me, I'd like to see this progress without refactoring it as a BIS. Uh, and Rob Wilton, just from a process perspective, I think if you do it as a BIS, you can run it through the process and highlight these are the things that have changed. Please try and focus reviews and comments on these, on these changes rather than saying, getting a review of the whole thing. So, um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that BIS has to be particularly heavy so that is an option uh, although I don't think you can actually stop people from reviewing the rest of the document. As contributor I'm actually in queue behind you Rob but as contributor I actually agree with Joe is that if this was core to implementation I think that this is right if you can function without it and it adds value 
uh, an augmentation is better. When I read it, I liked the augmentation, but that's just me as an individual, not as chair. Okay, so we will discuss this offline and uh, uh, I think we're going to move forward, but we'll discuss it offline afterwards. And if you were the no, please send a message to the list or put it in chat. We're interested in, in hearing from you. Thank you. So we got a fairly long slot. Uh, I, together with Joe, talk about uh, the, what's it called, the Ver DT, the versioning design team's weekly meetings uh, and the questions we send out there. And first to summarize where we are. Since the last ITF meeting, uh, we have had uh, uh, some voting in the last meeting and on the list after that, as of regarding this, uh, should we allow backwards compatible changes in the, in the Yang RFC? Uh, or sorry, should people that are using Yang be allowed to publish uh, non backwards compatible changes or not? And uh, the vote was we should allow this. That's our understanding. I think you. Um, very good. It was unanimous. That, that's, yes, that's what I understood. And uh, it also uh, was a debate whether we should step the Yang language revision number being 1.1 1 .1 at, at most recent, uh, if we should step that to 1.2, since in some ways we are redefining the language, even though none of the language constructs, no, nothing that the compiler cares about actually changed. And I think we agree that we do not change the step the language identification, version identification is keep 1.1. 1 .1. Yep, that's correct. Okay, thank you, good. So that's what we have established uh, already. And uh, after that, uh, we sent out uh, 10 questions to the working group. Uh, to, we had some proposals and see if everybody on the list agreed. And uh, for six of them, I think we have more or less agreed. I'll come to them later. And the first things I will focus on is the four that are more open to debate still, because uh, that's what I was hoping that we could spend some time on to, to, to fix. I see that there is no uh, mentioning here on this slide of our weekly meetings, but they are happening on Tuesdays at uh, 9 a.m. 9 um, Eastern or 3 p.m. Central European time. You can uh, find the links. There's been Quite often, uh, links are being mailed out on the mailing list. And everybody is most welcome. Anybody who has opinions about this, it would be good if you're in the meeting because it's difficult to discuss with ghosts. Uh, this has been going on for many years and we hope to at least close the basic documents as soon as possible now. The first item I want to bring up that was uh, still being debated, we don't know exactly how to proceed here, is about uh, file name changes. So one of the things we are doing in this versioning work is to add version labels. So current Yang modules, they have version dates. Every, that's supposed to uniquely identify which version of the Yang module you have. Uh, but we wanted to have this uh, semantic versioning labels. and. Uh, if you remember how the file name structure for Yang models are, you can optionally add an at sign and the date so that you can keep multiple versions of the same Yang module in the same directory and keep track of which one is which. And since we are introducing then labels, should we also reflect that in the file names? Should it be dates and labels or labels instead of dates? And we don't know exactly what we should do there. Um, there are several different options. Uh, we could uh, leave this undecided, which means that people can, of course, do whatever they want in their modules. And uh, one company can do one thing, another company does something else. Or we can move this to a, to a later specification, or we can keep it in the current set that we were aiming to take into last call as soon as possible. Are you hoping for comments now or at the end? Yeah, I think we can take them one at a time. So if anybody has any opinions about what we do about the file names, uh, now is a good time to bring that up. Talon? 
Yes, thank you, Italo Buse. I just commented to the, this morning on this uh, on the Edge Doc. I think it's better to wait for the next young version because this version is barely using the date as the main identifier of the young version, and the version is a, is a basically a tag for information. Maybe in the next version, I think it will be better to to reverse and use the the revision as the main identifier. I made also a working group last call that it will be good to have two revisions at the same date, because in practice, if you have multiple revisions, but then we need a young next. So my, my proposal is to keep the way it is today and uh, but I've, uh, I'm doing that in nine next and avoiding having two different ways to name the models in the, in the data store or in the young library will simplify the life, I think. Italo, before you go, uh, when do you think the next version would be? What do you mean by next version? The next one. <laughs> the, I think it will be good to do soon. <laughs> so to close this issue, close quickly and go to Jan Nest as quickly as possible. I, I think there is, uh, there's definitely room for Yang Next and I'm hoping we move on to Yang Next as soon as we wrap up versioning. But you know, Yang Next is gonna take a while. We shouldn't yeah. expect Yang Next is something quick. It's okay. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. I'm next, right? Yeah. Okay. Kent, as a contributor, I second Italo's comment entirely. Um, and, and also, uh, one extra point I think when we switch over to the labels, it should be that's the only way to do it. That, you know, we, we don't we let go the at with the date approach at that time. Fair. Jean Cisco. Uh, so I did a hackathon uh, project where uh, I added support for uh, labels in uh, current Piang. And uh, I think it's easy to update the tooling to do all this. So I think we could uh, do it now, actually, and suggest that we, instead of just uh, dropping label, uh, I mean, dropping revision dates uh, and switching to labels, uh, enable um, uh, so we can have uh, whatever scheme we want with some uh, tagging. Thanks. Okay, uh, Lou, as contributor, uh, I'm I would be I'm very concerned about just different vendors doing their own thing, and think that having a alternative that's specified would be better than allowing sort of a free for all. So I'm in favor again as a contributor, not as chair of looking at moving this to December. Any other comments? Thank you for your feedback. There will be more questions like this to bring up. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, the next thing is, uh, when you are importing modules in Yang, uh, you know, there's the possibility to import a specific version and that hasn't been very uh, useful, it turns out. It's a little bit too rigid. But something that has been uh, talked about uh, to replace that or to, to be useful instead is something called recommended min. And that's something that we have in the documents right now. But if we are, uh, if we are doing it with the current uh, modules, we have uh, the date that's uh, identifying these versions. So then we are suggesting that maybe we should have recommended mean date as an additional attribute uh, now. And uh, so that we can have a recommended mean label at some later point in time so they don't collide. So that's uh, uh, something we've been talking about. And also that this uh, recommended mean date or label would be treated mostly as a documentation thing. It's not something that compilers are expected to enforce. But I know Pear work on that as well, so you, maybe you can go to the mic and explain what you did. So Pear and Jean Cisco again. Um, yeah, so I basically uh, did this that you would uh, suggest on, on the last point there, that uh, just checking the revisions, seeing if the uh, recommended min labels are in order, and if they if they are not, just uh, produce a warning, uh, and that is the on the level I think it should be. Thank you. So, any other comments when it comes to 
recommended mean date or label or anything? I can't as a contributor. I, the word recommended, it's not um, saying it has to be. What, so what, what does that mean? If, if, if it's, if, if, it, if they don't, if it's less than the recommended, is it wrong? I mean, you just said it's a warning, but the word recommended, it's, it, maybe you can use recommended now as a very soft way of allowing this to proceed before Yang next. But when we get to Yang next, it would just simply be uh, min version. That is definitely a potential development, but okay, I cannot predict what Yang Next is going to do with this, but that is a possibility. What, what I'm trying to say is it would it make sense then, what Yang Next would say that it's, it's more of a must rather than a should. Because right now I think with the word recommended, it's like a should and it, it produces a warning. But in Yang Next, it'd be more like a must, in which case it'd produce an error. I have heard this sentiment presented before, but I don't know exactly if that's a minority or majority opinion. And when it comes to, I maybe recommended is not exactly, or should is not maybe a catch, uh, capturing this intent exactly. I would say this more like the author of this module thinks that things will be easier for you if you go this way. But it's of course, if you want to do something else, sure, go ahead. Uh, so Rob Wilton is a contributor. Um, so this issue and how we've expressed it has evolved over time. So we started off with like a stricter minimum value you had to have. That's where we started from. And then uh, we changed it for two reasons. One of them was this pushback of you can't make this change in Yang 1.1. So there was that, that aspect of it. And, uh, and I think from that perspective, moving it to being uh, like a recommended guide that's rather than a strict thing just sort of fixes that. But the other aspect that came out was an observation of people saying that we shouldn't really be doing like conformance checks within the Yang language, the modules themselves. And that conformance would be better done for example, through Yang library, Yang packages, which is a bit more flexible. And, um, and the specific case that I was concerned about with this recommended min is that when you have branching occurs and you write in a recommended min for a particular version, it might be that there's another version that has that definition, but it doesn't see it in the tree. And so I was wondering then if you made it, make it very strict that it actually causes you more grief where you can't use, um, can't use a file that you know is entirely valid where you, whether, where, whether otherwise you keep it softer as like a just sort of text recommendation as a warning, you'd still be allowed to compile and say, ultimately I'm going to rely on uh, the Yang package to define all my set of files in my directory to say exactly what I'm using. And this becomes a softer warning. Does, I don't know if that makes sense in how I explained it. Yeah, unfortunately I didn't quite follow that, I, um, but we could take it offline. Okay, I tried. <laughs> Uh, I'll note that on your slide, you don't say that there, you don't have a specific recommendation or question for the group right now on this slide. No, and I, I, know, I, I, know, I know, I'm not talking about the list discussion. Yes, because we are split in the group. We don't know exactly what to say about this. That's why. And the, the discussion points, there's things, things that we picked up that people commented on the list. So these are some of the feedback that we got. But we don't know exactly what to do with this in the vertical group. So when you say you're split, is it that you have two camps of very different opinions or are you saying you don't have any sort of um, uh, consensus points at all? No, I don't think, uh, Rob, you can. Um, I'm not sure whether I, this will, I'll try and accurately reflect what's been discussed. I think the concern is some people think this feature is really important. We should do it now and it's worth doing. And I think the other people are concerned that because there's pushback on doing this, that it might make our lives a bit easier just to say, you know, let's park this until later to remove uh, one road bump from getting this document done. So I think that to me felt like that was the balance. I was in the favor of um, this isn't important enough to do now. So it's a nice thing to have, but it's not worth blocking the rest of the work on. So there's no one who was saying that they dislike having this capability. It was more about getting this work done. I believe so. That's, that's my uh, recollection. Yeah, Joe's saying he agrees. Okay. Uh, we have a few people in queue, but maybe we'll do a little poll on in importance. Okay. Well, and I was just going to say, going back to my earlier comment, the, it seems like the recommended men, is, the phraseology of it is a compromise of, to allow it to go through now. Whereas if we were to defer and wait until Yang next, then it would be more just of a, a men 
version. And I, I, I'm, <laughs> I know you're going to, I don't I, understand the comment that you made before, but it seemed like a, a, a two pass um, compiler would be able to resolve the dependencies that you mentioned. Um, so, so I won't, I won't try to explain it again, but what I'll say is I don't, I don't know if we were to delay this work, I suspect we might end up with exactly the same solution. That, that would be my instinct is we wouldn't end up with a different solution because of one of those technical constraints. Right, so you're preparing a poll. Yeah. I think Jason may have some input. As yeah. Uh, Jason Stern, um, I just want to echo what Kent said that um, this was weakened from kind of a conformance statement to a recommended min and with the idea that that would allow us to keep it in the work and have it included in this. So personally, I'm in favor of keeping it because it's effectively just a machine readable documentation that helps uh, users of the module or people constructing packages to know you know what version of included modules they uh, they should use. So I think it was it was already softened in order to uh, allow us to keep it. In my opinion. Okay, the poll says is men needed now, but it should be read as recommended men needed now. Uh, actually, that was um, intentional because we've said that we're going to end up with the same language. So I am saying is min needed now. And, uh, I, I that's understand. unfortunate because I'm, now I'm going to say no, whereas before <laughs> I would have said yes. I'm okay with doing a second poll with yeah. recommended. Okay. Ah. Uh. The poll, the way the poll shows in Meet Echo has changed. No opinion means it's just see the count of people who have not participated. It's not that they've registered no opinion. <laughs> That's right. Explicitly. It starts well, right now. We have forty-two people right. participants. So. so we'll give a, a minute or two for more participation. Then we'll rerun this with the same wording, but recommended men. Okay, so slightly in favor of yes, but I wouldn't call that a, uh, you know, a clear split. Give me a moment. I love that everyone here is my typing. So I'd ask that if you uh, would prefer men over recommended men, just register no opinion, just so it's a little clearer. So don't vote yes for both, or don't voice yes for both polls, please. I think we're ending up exactly the same number for uh, recommended men as uh, as men. So um, yeah, I don't know if we add our numbers together or do what. <laughs> well, I, I switched my vote. <laughs> That's fine. OK. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think we're getting to a point of saying uh, clear consensus. We may be getting to a point of rough consensus. And you know, so this one's going to end up being rough either way. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the feedback anyway. Uh, it's good information to have when we are trying to progress this in some way uh, in the next upcoming calls. And uh, if anybody's interested in this topic, please join our, our Tuesday calls. We move on to the next one. So young uh, versioning of instance data. And I think this is a similar question. Is this needed now or can we wait? There was not uh, any feedback, I think, on uh, the on the hedge doc. 
and on the mailer. So anybody have comments about this? Do we need to include the versioning of instance data now? Sorry about the noise. I was just going to add a comment as a contributor that I don't think that document actually says very much about it now. So actually, it's not that necessarily we're losing very much by moving this data. So I, I'm not sure it matters too much either way. Yeah. Okay. The so, lack of comments on the list and uh, and in the room, I think, uh, supports your notion that it's not the most important one. So so given the the lack of discussion, I'm going we're suggesting a different phrasing here. Is can you live without this? So if you can live without this, say yes. If you can, uh, uh, if you really, really want it, say no. And the end result is we're going to put this one to bed if it, we end up with people saying they can live without it. So again, not huge participation but of those who are participating, uh, I think the, 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 the views are unanimous. We can live without it. Absolutely. So this is easier if, to you, interpret if you think this is important, please bring it up on the list. Otherwise, you're going to see it go away. Thank you. Good feedback. And the last one that's uh, on, of this type here is uh, about uh, versioning, taking uh, white space into account when you're defining versions. So if you have a Yang module and you change, you add your space, your line breaks or something like that a bit, not, in, I mean, some space and white space, uh, sorry, some space and line breaks are really significant and we're not talking about those now. This is only insignificant white space. Does that, uh, if you are modifying that, should you call that a new version? And uh, one particular thing to note is that if you say that the white space changes are important as well, then we can do things like checksumming and saying that this module has this particular, you have CRC or some other checksum to see that this is exactly the version that, that we have had in the past. Beautiful. Sure. What, what's the poll that you want? Um, Does white space changes matter or not? Maybe is a good question. I mean, the, the, do you agree that white space changes should constitute a new version? Should, should. That was a short question. Version. <laughs> yeah, the, the other one that I really would like, but it's too late for, is should white space be included in the checksum? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you could, of course, <laughs> define some other sort of canonization of Yang modules and do a checksum over that. Yeah, we probably should have made it clear to not include white space, and then we wouldn't have this problem had we done that. That's, that's absolutely one option. But it, then you can't use ordinary CRT tools because you need to have some sort of processor in yeah, yeah. that's canonizing it. Yeah. Right, you would need a preprocessor. Yes, yes, agreed. So if you say that this uh, is uh, important, like this, you can use all the existing tools right away. Uh, so, so, so Lou, I think that's exactly the question we're really asking here: is when you do, you want to generate a checksum of a Yang file, uh, can you do it in the plain text? In which case, then it becomes meaningful, or do you have to get a canonical representation of it first and then do a checksum? So that's to me what it comes down to, and that's why it went this this direction. Really. Right. That's why I was saying, what question do we really want to ask it out? Yeah. Well, um, maybe ask them both. I don't know. Do you, are you ready to go? Um, well, I wasn't going to run. Um, oh, okay, sure. So the first one is, uh, I think we're going to ask the question as phrased on the slide. I'm not as uh, quick, so I'm just going to say as phrased on the slide. Um, well, hold on. Okay, maybe I should. Uh, uh, Jason, you're in queue. Jason Stern. Um, I mean, one implication if we don't uh, require it to be um, considered a different version is that uh, imagine a publisher or owner of a, of a module um, publishes a version, uh, whatever you want to label it, uh, if we're using labels, we call it version 300. And then that author, that authoritative source, also somewhere publishes 
another slightly different version of the file with only insignificant white space changes, but it will it will look different. Say they move some things around, uh, change the formatting descriptions or shrink their line length. Um, if we say that's not a different version, uh, then those two copies of that file are floating around, both labeled 300. And is that what we'd want? So that's, that's the part that kind of worries me a bit. It's, 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 it's more about if the author owner of the module publishes a definitive version in the place where they publish their definitive versions uh, with only insignificant white space changes. I, I just found it hard to see how they could not be considered two different versions. I mean, we'd only bump the editorial digit if you're using like Assembler, for example, but uh, I don't know how you'd reconcile the two copies floating around. So I, th I think if you look at the question, it says, does it require a new revision to be published? So it would not have a fourth digit change. It would be the identical uh, version. There would be no change number. All right, you would have two different modules with different checksums, but it's the same module in some way. Different checksums that include, if you're including white spaces, yes. if you have normalized, they'd have identical checksums. Exactly, very good. And I, mean, I don't know if this is the time for discussion, but checksums aren't something that we've standardized in the past. I mean, we have revision dates, we're talking about revision labels, never have we talked about checksums. And so I don't know why, you, I mean, I understand uh, mechanically, the mechanics, like why a management system might like to use checksums, but I don't think that's a feature or function that we've defined in the past. All right, uh, let's not dive in too deep into the discussions, but uh, if you had been in the Tuesday calls, uh, you would have heard, I mean, this sort of horror stories that we see in the field, mm. where it's kind of good to know that you're actually using exactly, not what the body claims to be, but what it is. So checksums are, uh, at least in my experience, um, useful for, for, for real. People modify Yang modules without updating the date sometimes. And stuff. So we, we've gotten some participation, you know, about half in the room, uh, and of that half, uh, we have uh, uh, three to one of preferring to ignore white space. Um, so that's some good information, not conclusive. Again, we're going to, wherever we end up here, it's going to be, there's some, someone's going to be in the rough. Yeah. But it's still good feedback. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Atalo, you, it shows you're in queue, and Joe, you're in queue. I don't know if you both still want to be there. Yes, I have a comment on the white space. Huh? It's okay. Um, what I notice sometimes when I download uh, YAM files from different sources uh, is that uh, sometimes there is an empty line at the end, and sometimes there is not an empty line on the line at the end. And I think that taking the white spaces into account uh, will confuse a little bit uh, when, when you have this type of problem, because this empty line is a different <laughs> white space, in my opinion, and will, will fail. So I'm much, very much in favor of the normalization for a checksum to make... Uh, because otherwise, it's, I mean, looking at the, our current experience is going to be difficult uh, to make sure that the two young models are the same. That's good. Thank you. Uh, Joe Clark, so what Jason said was you have versions floating around or you have instances of a, of, a, of a Yang module floating around. And I know, Jan, one of the things you wanted to solve from a Tuesday call was I want to know that I have the canonically correct version 3.0.0. So I might go to vendor foo and download 3.0.0. And if someone gave me a different 3.0.0 and I really wanted to make sure that I had the right one and I ran a checksum tool against it, if they added a new new line or they added some trailing white space and it was wrong, I don't trust this module. I don't know what else they may have done. Sure, I can run some tools and figure that out, but I'd rather just go back to vendor foo's website and download it. So if I care about checksums, if I care about knowing that I have the canonical 3.0.0, I would want to make sure that, that there is a formal publication of that module. That may not be the case to, to Italo's point. Um, so my point has always been, if we have a formal canonical source for a module and we want to do something like checksumming, then we have to take this into account. We have to make these white spaces matter. And if I'm going to publish a new version as the authoritative publisher of that module, and I just choose to change a white space, then I would also need to bump the revision, uh, the version. Okay. And, okay. Kent is a contributor. 
if you were to try to convert uh, compare the checksum that you created to some canonical checksum, where would that canonical checksum come from? Where would it be published? I asked the same question on the call, and Jan, uh, in that particular instance, said it would be published on the website next. There would be like a checksums.txt. Okay, next. That, that's a kind of the expected answer. But I, then I wonder why we call this um, semver and not checksumver, <laughs> right? Balash. So uh, I agree with Italo that people are not so precise and it will cause more confusion if we a new, a new line at the end of the file would make this different. I am strongly in support of normalizing at least to some level before applying the checksum. And by the way, I think the example of uh, reformatting a description, that for me is a significant change. So that's uh, out of scope of this discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Uh, that was good uh, for the working group to hear. I think we can now move on to the six uh, items that we understand or have, uh, we have a belief in the working group, uh, in the design team uh, that these are all agreed on now. We'll just confirm that with you. So just to change that a little bit, huh? this is what was sent to the list yes. as what the decisions are based on the previous discussions. Yes, this is so, our understanding of uh, what, the, that's right. what the so entire it's... working group wants. We just want to check that with you. This is our interpretation. Yeah. So uh, at the top of a module, uh, we have this version colon non-backwards compatible marking. If you're doing a non-backwards compatible change, you have to add this at the top of the module. We believe the working group's uh, consensus is that we should have that, keep that in the current set of things we want to go from last forward. T2, uh, we have uh, updated uh, some of the rules in section 11 of 7950 and section 10 of 6020 when it comes to okay, turning something into status obsolete is now considered non-backwards compatible. Uh, and uh, that those changes, and that's just one example, there are a couple of other wordings has changed too, but it's relatively minor. So those uh, word changes, we understand everybody wants them to be there, to, to, that we should retain them in the set that we go with now. T3, uh, in the drafts that we uh, have circulated earlier, there was something called the Revision Label Scheme, allowing different uh, organizations, uh, companies, vendors, to publish their own scheme in the, in the framework of this particular set of drafts. So you could declare your own Revision Label Scheme. Uh, we understand that we should now remove this so that this particular set of drafts is only produ producing semantics for one particular scheme, the yang Semver scheme. And if anybody, any other organization would like to have some other scheme, they can go and define their own draft for that. So we will take revision label scheme out. T4. So uh, revision label extension, we are moving that to the Yang Semver module. So it's just, uh, we are just moving it from one draft to another. That's basically it. So um, we think it fits better there uh, when there's no different revision label schemes. It's the more natural thing to do. I'm not seeing anybody in the queues or so. Uh, Silence means you agree. <laughs> I, I, I take it as silence means you can live with this. Yeah. Because right. I actually okay. don't yeah. agree with all these personally as a contributor, but I can live with all of them. Yeah. Okay. And then we have T5. Um, there was some language uh, in our drafts uh, about how to resolve ambiguous imports in Yang Library. Um, we are removing this language and deferring it to Yang next. So there will be certain cases where you don't really know uh, what it means in Yang library. T6. 
And T6, we have some uh, uh, language about how deprecated and obsolete nodes are handled. And we think this should remain in the, in the, yeah. in the first set of things that we want to go to last hallway. Sounds good. Very good. Thank you for that. I can't skip ahead anymore. That's that's the end. Yes, that's the end. Okay, good. Uh, there's, there's then it's other, Joe's part then. Yeah. Different different decks. Okay. We have to share the next deck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next one, go ahead and make the announcement. <laughs> I got the right one, Joe. Yep, this looks right. Um, so some of the issues that, that uh, Jan just uh, mentioned there, we're gonna go into a little more detail in this slide or this deck. What we're talking about here, same with the, uh, the Tuesday meetings, the, the contributors and authors around uh, module versioning. We've been talking about this semantic versioning for Yang for a while. In 117, we called this key issue two. Key issue one was about the uh, non-backwards compatible changes and the version of Yang. Um, key issue two from that meeting was about uh, whether or not we needed, as Jan just pointed out, whether or not we needed multiple revision label schemes. So way back when, when we were the design team, there was this thinking that, yes, we do need this. Vendor A will want to bring their proprietary Version, uh, uh, versioning scheme, vendor B will want to bring their proprietary versioning scheme. So we should make this as flexible as possible. Yes, we'll have one thing that is recommended or prescribed for the IETF, but we need to support these other vendors. That said, it added complexity. It also added some contention uh, with the working group uh, on list. And ultimately no one really brought any concrete examples of what they wanted to use. Simber seemed to be good enough. Um, so our recommendation after discussing this is we would drop, as, as Jan said, we would drop the multiple revision label schemes and we would stick with the, the name I put there, the Yang Simber colon version, the Yang Simber namespace colon version. That's still to be decided, but as an example, it would be moved into the Yang Simber draft and this would be the extension it would be yang dash simver colon version or something along those lines. It would be not a flexible, you pick the scheme, but this would be the revision label. And the reason we still want a revision label is because we feel it's, it's important, it's valuable to encode that, that compatibility or do a rough encoding of that compatibility information into something that is human readable. So that's why we want to keep that. So our recommendation, remove the scheme, the, the flexible schemes, stick to one revision label, and that will be this Yang Simver. No one stood up when, when Jan mentioned it, but I will pause here and see if there are any comments on this recommendation, this key issue. I think the working group has spoken. We don't have to okay. keep asking. Cop okay, no, <laughs> that's fair. Thank you, Lou. Key issue number three, again, we called it three in 117. This was why do we need Yang Simver when there's this perfectly good Simver 2.0.0 that's already out there. So a little bit about Simver 2.0.0. First of all, it is linear. It does not really support any kind of branching. And I have an example of this that, that will kind of give you a little clarity there. It's simpler in construction, so this is a good thing. It's got this concept of a major version component where you have these breaking or non-backwards compatible changes. You have a minor component where you can add features, but you don't break any of the things that used to work. And then you have this patch component for these editorial changes or changes that aren't adding features, they're not taking anything away, they're maybe adding some clarity. Let's take a look at an example here. So let's say you have 1.0.0 and you come out with 1.0.1 and then 1.0.1 just clarified something and then, now, then you want to add a feature. So you come out with a 1.1.0, great features out there, but then you want to just radically shift the paradigm, uh, shake some things up, break some things, non-backward compatible changes. So you come out with 2.0.0. Now one of your customers says, this is great and all, we're using 1.0.1 and we would like this new feature. 
okay? So what do you do? What can you do here? Well, one thought, and, and, and at least initially, my, my gut instinct was, oh, well, we already have a 1.1.0, a feature release on top of 1.0. Why not come up with 1.2.0? Let's bump that. And Jason pointed out that this, become, this is an ambiguous thing because 2.0.0 is already out. So if you come out with a 1.2.0, does it incorporate any of the new features of 2.0.0? Or better yet, is 2.0.0 incorporating that new feature that you added in 1.2.0? And you don't really know that. So the clearer thing to do and why there is necessarily no branching here is the less ambiguous thing is to mint a 2.1.0 release. Um, that adds that new feature. Um, you could do a 1.2.0, but again, it, it's, it's ambiguous with what might be in 2.0.0 relative to the, the, the new 1.2.0 um, feature release. So that's Simber 2.0.0. What we discussed from a versioning standpoint, however, was something that was somewhat non-linear. So we had the linear Simber, um, we decided, or part of our, our version requirements and part of the things we discussed, this slide actually came from um, ITF 105, uh, was that we wanted to have this modular uh, or module versioning that was dependent or, or use the uh, date, the revision date of the module. And using that, that lineage, using that history, we could determine if a new revision was descended from, I should say, descended from a previous revision. So this allowed for some level of branching. We didn't want to just arbitrarily branch all over the place, but we wanted to allow for some level of branching. Unfortunately, though, the dates alone, and this is why we have to do that, that kind of uh, look up uh, the, the, the lineage in the revision history, dates alone don't tell the whole story. So in this example here, we have something coming off of uh, 2019-0201 that ultimately descends to 2019-0501. But what happens if you, you look at 2019-0601? You might assume that since it's later date-wise than 2019-0501, it's fully compatible with that version of the module. Whereas if you look at the, the lineage, the history, it's not necessarily, that's not necessarily the case because they did not descend from a common parent. Um, 2009-0501 might contain other non-backwards compatible changes. So we, need, we needed something that reflected or allowed us to reflect this. And that got into a lot of discussion since IETF 105 up until uh, today in 118, that we needed a, a version, a revision label scheme that also reflected this limited branching. But we also wanted something that the human brain, when they, they already kind of get Grok Simver, that they could look at this and apply the Simver rules to it. So we developed a modified version of Simver that we call Yang Simver, that without any branching, if you don't do any branching in, in your modules, which is almost certainly going to be the case for the overwhelming majority of IETF modules, if not all of them, without that branching, our Yang Simber scheme is 100% compatible to Simber. The rules are the same. It looks the same. However, when you do need that branching, you're going to have this new modifier component. So you have the major, the minor, the patch, as I already talked about. Then you'll have an underscore and one of these two things. You'll have an underscore compatible when you're creating a, a feature release on top of, a, of another release that, that doesn't break anything, doesn't have any non-backward compatible changes. And then you'll have an underscore non-underscore compatible when you are introducing some non-backwards compatible or breaking changes. So as an example, you have that same 1.0.0, 1.01, 1, and so on and so forth. And your customer said, we're using 1.0.1 and we need a feature added to that. You could branch and mint a 1.0.2 since other version numbers are already taken. You take, you increment the patch version and you add this modifier that Yang Simver defines uh, underscore compatible in this case, since it's a feature release, it's not adding anything that's non-backwards compatible. And that's your new 
Yang Simver version label for this module. So that's the kind of the, the wherefore and, and, and the history there. So our recommendation from the authors and contributors is that given that we're already allowing this branching and module versioning, again, we need our, our revision label scheme to support this. We have the one scheme and we're recommending that be Yang Simver, which balances nicely between the simplicity that Simver 2.0.0 provides and allows for some of that, uh, that, that branching that we talked about. We think, again, without any other concrete examples of needing other revision label schemes, we think that this is sufficient for both the SDOs and we've had some liaison statements from 3GPP that says they like this as well, as well as vendors. The vendors uh, as part of the Tuesday call um, are, are either already using something like this, the Yang Simber, or can, can make this work. Comments, thoughts? I think this might be my last slide. So, Kent is a contributor. Yeah, I feel like I'm out of water, but um, the, like a fish out of water. The underscore compatible and underscore non compatible. I, I wonder I, okay, if it says either one of those, then it's still the case that they have to go to the revision history to understand fully the, the relationship. So in all cases, they have to go to the revision history to understand the, the full, uh, to fully understand what happened. So why then do we need to have the underscore uh, with the suffix at all? Um, so yes, they would have to look, if they wanted to really understand what the, the, the lineage is, they would have to look at the revision history um, because you don't, you, you assume that one, but you don't really know. Uh, we wanted it there for that, that uh, encoding back up, few slides, I said the, the rough encoding of compatibility information. So a human could look at this and go, ah, okay, I know that there is something that, that may or may not affect my tooling. In this case, since it's a compatible, probably not affecting uh, my tooling. It, it, it's adding something versus breaking something. But I would want to see that if it is a 1.0.3 non-backward compatible, that would alert me that perhaps I need to do some deeper analysis into what is non-backwards compatible in this module that can break my tooling. Because it's not just a 1.0.3. I can't assume that, that because it's, it's just a patch change from the 1.0.1 I'm using, that I can just use this module. There, there's something that could break what I'm, what I'm doing in here. I, I guess that's the part where I don't understand. Because if it is a patch change, uh, almost the definition of being a patch change means it doesn't break anything. And so now you're saying that there can be some patches that do break and some yeah. patches yes. that don't break. Yes, we, that's, we have existence proof of that. Yeah. Yes, okay. that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that we are, are saying that we're basing our change off of this patch version, but what, or off of this version, but we're making a, maybe a single non-backwards compatible change. So it's based off, it, it has a base of 1.0.1. The only reason we're using, we're incrementing the patch version is because we can't increment anything else at that point. And we have to also reflect that something is breaking in here. So it's not a true patch release in the sense of what Simber 2.0.0 calls a patch release. So this is why we introduced the modifier. Ram Kumar. Hey, uh, Ram Kumar from Cisco. So in that case, uh, you don't really need the compatible modifier, right? Because if there is no modifier, it means it's compatible. Or you don't need the compat modifier. We, we think you do because technically, if I'm using my, if I have my Semver hat on and I just see 1.0.2, I'm just thinking that is an editorial change. There's nothing, sub, there's nothing substantive perhaps in that change. However, what the compatible is saying, it's not saying that it, it it's, it's kind of saying two things. It's saying, yes, it's backwards compatible, but there is a feature or there is something that would otherwise be the equivalent of a minor version change in this module that you might want to be aware of. You might have a new feature in here that you can make use of. Um, so again, as a human, you might, oh, okay, there's something, it's, it's not urgent because it's not going to break anything, but it's something I might want to look into. So yes, it's backwards compatible, but what the, the 
underscore compatible is signaling there is there's something more in this module than would otherwise be allowed by a simple patch change. Okay, thanks. Sure thing. Until anyone else gets in the queue, I just, uh, back in NetConf, Kent made the point of asking a speaker, what are your next steps? And I thought, hmm, that was a good question. Uh, I didn't have any here. Our next steps are to fold in from the module versioning draft. If, if this, in, in fact, it sounds like this is the consensus, to fold this work from module versioning back in December. Um, it's not gonna be as trivial as it might initially seem to uh, collapse the multiple revision schemes um, and to clarify some of this uh, in, in the single um, Yang Simber document. So that, that's what we're going to do uh, once we, we hit the green light here. All right, that's the end of this slide. Okay, that's, uh, appreciate all the discussion and the uh, keeping us making progress on it. Look forward to the next update. Yours is a little less contentious than the previous one, but so that's lucky. We have a number of, we have four uh, non-chartered items now. Uh, Shang, you're first. Oh no, I'm sorry. We're going out of order. Uh, uh, Alex, thanks for starting to move. Uh, eight, it's the one with eight in it. Um, we're going to do something, try something a little different on your timer. You're actually going to have two minutes less, so we will reserve two minutes for discussion. 16 slides. So you have eight minutes for 16 slides. Okay, <laughs> All right, that'll be okay. fine. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so yes, yeah, so I'm, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for accommodating the thing. Oh. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I, uh, I'm presenting a new proposal uh, on mounting Yang defined information from remote data stores. So I'm presenting also on behalf of um, Eric Voigt, Iowa, and uh, Nacho. Um, so, what's the motivation of this? Uh, motivation here is that today Yang data stores provide local management data with a device level scope. Um, however, we have increasingly use cases that are appearing. Um, that require more holistic and network-wide views. For instance, when we look at uh, controllers, um, uh, there, you, there you would basically have things uh, that, go, that really span across different devices in the network um, as part of the same data store that we would want to model. Um, and there are more and more use cases popping up he uh, here. There's a lot of discussion on topologies, on digital maps, uh, network inventory, and the IV uh, working group, uh, network di digital twin, those types of use cases. And uh, one implication is that only all of these, um, in, the, in those cases, the data model includes information about devices which are also included in the network using their own data stores. So basically this means that there are some, there are some data that becomes increasingly redundant, requiring redundant modeling, re requiring synchronization, requiring redundant population and so forth. Um, and so the question is, how can we accommodate that better? And uh, yeah, so uh, again, yeah, the, 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 the issues are kind of like what I mentioned here. Um, so we ideally we would really want to avoid the synchronization of and remodeling of data, which is already pre present in one level, and just included in the other level as well. So really what's needed is a federated data store that provides a holistic view of a network. So basically you think of federated data uh, which includes data which resides, which may reside on remote nodes, uh, cross nodes, but which can be accessed by the client of that controller, for instance, as if it were one conceptual data store. And so, hence the the the, the, the proposal here to uh, in, introduce the concept of um, peer mount. Basically, uh, the rough analogy is that of mount points in a distributed file system basically allowing to refer um, data nodes or actually really subtrees that are in a remote data uh, store as if they were part of a local uh, data store. The, basically by doing this, you can access it uh, basically transparently for the, you know, for the client application. You avoid the need for data replication. Of course, there are caching and considerations that are apply. Um, uh, the authority remains, um, and of course, the authority remains with the original owner. Basically, so it's basically just about providing a view. Again, why? 
it allows you to provide a federated data store that allows you to treat the network as a system. Um, yeah, so then basically this, you, this is here depicted on this, on, on this diagram that essentially the, the red and the green nodes are, well, can be viewed as if they were part also of the, of the blue data store. Um, an example of a usage, so basically, essentially the, the core of the, uh, the technical contents of the, uh, of the draft consists of the definition of a Yang module, which defines a couple of things. Uh, most centrally are a set of peer mount extensions that allow you to define, a, uh, to declare a mount point in a module and which, which points to a remote target and to a remote subtree uh, to basically specify the information that should be included there. And then the idea is that basically as, uh, as you define this mount point, you see this depicted here. And if you were to then, for instance, return instance data, you return the instance data which, resi which resides locally, as well as data under the mount point depicted in blue and the instance data from the remote system, which you have here uh, in red. So a lot easier to use. It's kind of like, again, this federated data store option. Um, okay, so what are the use cases? Why are we doing this? So it's, uh, for instance, if you wanted to provide a network-wide view of a network inventory of a network digital twin, but also include for it certain actual device configuration aspects from the, from the systems. So data on hardware, firmware, lo location information, and so forth. Or likewise, we wanted to have a network inventory or digital twin type of thing, which, or topology, which also provides your live monitoring data. What is the link status? What is the power status? And uh, so forth to use some of those use cases. And again, basically the design pay pattern in each of those cases, you would, is, you would define a mount point in this, yeah, in this uh, network wide uh, module, which allows us to essentially incorporate the, the subtrees from the individual nodes within that. And I realize I'm running low on time, so let me, skip some of the next slides. So basically this says, okay, there are so the issue, well, what if not every, not, what if not every remote system contains the information that you want? Well, there are certain design patterns uh, that you can uh, use to deal with that. Um, again, the core of the, uh, of the definition is basically this, this Yang module, not depicted here, but at the core there are these Yang extensions that allow you to declare the mount points as well as facilities to manage those mount points to, for instance, uh, specify certain things such as communication and retry policies. You do need to access remote data after all um, and so forth, as well as also uh, RPCs for the manual uh, mounting and unmounting uh, if that is needed. A um, couple of additional considerations. Um, mount cascades are supported, but of course you cannot uh, mount well, pro prohibited should be circular mounting for obvious reasons. In terms of operations, uh, the focus right now is just on data retrieval. So other operations such as configuration support and so forth is outside the scope. Uh, configuration would incur transactional ramifications, so we want to stay away from that. Notification Yang push are potentially doable when the need arises, but again, to keep the complexity low, um, this is, we're not touching this. Um, again, authorization, the Target system is the authoritative owner. Um, caching is conceivable as an implementation uh, optimization. And um, yeah. Uh, okay, so just to come to, to stay within the time, this final slide. So um, some final remarks are there. Uh, so actually, um, um, one thing to mention is there was an earlier proposal um, made uh, 10 years ago. Uh, which at the time there was no really actually that did not receive uptake because basically because there was no ITF interest in data models about the data uh, above the device level at this uh, at, uh, at the time so this did not gain traction however we believe that the time may be right now be, uh, because now there are more and more network-wide models which are becoming into ITF scope, which will be facing this problem of redundant data that we have there. And therefore, basically, we're reviving this proposal with some modifications, simplifications in view of the new context and use cases that we have. And hence the question, if there's interest in taking up this work. Thanks. And I see you. Radio Lutka, I do remember your work from those, mm -hmm. was it 
10 or maybe even 15 ago. years yeah. ago. Something like that, yeah. But then with the ascent of, of schema mount, I mm. remember I commented that uh, really mount means mounting data, like as you mentioned, mm. uh, NFS or something like that. So I was sort of against naming this schema mount to use this word mm. mount. This didn't happen, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think if you introduce this again here, with the same name, it becomes really confusing. Oh. So I would suggest to do well, something else because people will get immediately yeah. lost with all this. So, yeah, good point. So, well, the question, well, so clearly we can name this something else. One thing to be clear, and in the interest of time, I could not go into the differences to schema mount. We are, of course, very well aware of that. The schema mount is about mounting a schema which is then instantiated locally, right? You want to just reuse the model, but you don't have this federated, this remoting aspect. Here we are, it, this is about uh, mounting instances that live on remote systems. So it's a different problem space, but I agree that the naming is maybe close or maybe we can come up with a different term. We have four people in queue and the queue is now locked. Uh, Jason Stern's next. And we are over time, so try to keep your remarks and questions short, Jason. Um, Jason Stern, just a quick question. When you compose these models, how do you deal with absolute leaf refs uh, and absolute paths and must statements in the models you're taking from the devices? Well, so for the, well, uh, so first of all, we're, we're, we're providing a read only view. Basically, this is about uh, retrieval of information in terms of must statements and so forth. Those things are, would be applicable only when you support configuration operations. So we don't believe that this applies here because the data is authoritatively owned by the remote system. So this is just about uh, providing the view here. The leaf ref paths though in, in those composed models won't make sense if you expose that northbound of the controller. Any absolute leaf ref paths, right? Well, so, well, I mean, so the question is if you wanted to have the, leaf, well, if you wanted to have leaf ref paths that extend across mounted data, but that's that's your question. Uh, no, so, but uh, uh, I don't want to take the whole time, so maybe I'll I'll take this. Yeah, to the take list. it to right. take it to the list. I, I don't think it answered his question, at least not that okay. one I heard. Right. So, so just a quick comment. I thought the Yang mounts would have covered some of this requirement. I didn't think there was a requirement with Yang mount that it had to be locally mounted. I think the case of VR, they don't call it virtual routers, but I You're thought. You're talking about schema mount. I mean, schema mount. Yeah. It's so different. It, it is different. In the past, actually, in the, in the effort 10 years ago, there was something included called alias mount. That is basically something that was addressed by schema mount, but not here. But I see actually the naming is <laughs> creating perhaps more questions than is, than is good for this. So I, but it was different. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, <laughs> so my question really was then whether you extend schema mounts so to cover some of this data, because I don't see the difference um, between mounting a schema here and then saying this is the reference where the data is. Some of the principles are, this, are have similarities, but it's a different thing because yeah. you do end up with the same schema. So there, there's some parallelism, but I, I, I think this is different work. Okay. And clearly we have to discuss it on the list. Mm -hmm. um, in the interest of time, uh, we have two more. We have Jan uh, and uh, Ignacio. Those are the last two comments, but clearly there's interested interest in this work, so we're going to want to discuss on the list. Yeah, I just want to say that I've read the draft, and I think it was interesting. I think there are many open questions relating to this mm -hmm. work, and we have implemented much of similar life functionality, so I know this is really hard to do right. Mm -hmm. okay. Hi, uh, Nacho from Telefonica. Very quickly. Uh, we, we have an alternative to uh, the mount term, which is uh, data virtualization that uh, we also uh, reference in the in the in the draft, and this is a term that is widely used in in data communities. So we could go for. The Can you repeat the term? I didn't hear. It. Data virtualization. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. I'll speak as a co-author. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. A thank you. Interest. Uh, Scott. No. Keep fun. I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm glad it's a sequence. Which one? Okay, this is a mutable, right? This is number six. Okay. The numbers aren't showing. So I, I will yeah. give uh, an update of this immutable flag work. You might notice that the document title has now been updated. So uh, the immutable flag, actually, this work is derived from the system defined configuration work. 
when we explore the different kinds of system configuration, people identify that there are deletable system, deletable, non-deletable, and modifiable, non-modifiable system configuration. So this immutable flag is used to document the immutability of some system configuration. Though we want to uh, explore some use cases uh, beyond system configuration, but now it is not available because of some non-transactional API discussion. So for this work, it, it was uh, the chair has raised adoption poll after the ITF 117 meeting. I think we have received some concern and objections from the list. So I'm going to uh, present some the, the major concern we have received uh, during the adoption call and how the draft is updated to resolve that concern. So the the the, the very uh, the first big concern is that the uh, the server can dynamically decide what is considered immutable. I think um, so that this value would make the life of the client much more harder, but much harder. But I want to clarify that this is not the case in the document now, because we 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 we, we want to think that this immutability and this instantiated value are relatively stable because uh, we clarify in the draft that the immutability and the value must only change during the system upgrade or due to the license or addition of the removal of the, the hardware. So this is independent on the operational stat. And there are some texts pointed out to be ambiguous, maybe by pointed out by Yugen, and now it has been removed from the latest revision. And if someone finds there is other uh, expression that might be confusion pointed out and the authors can then see how to refine it. So the second concern is about that the server's behavior follows the young module, not the very wrong. I think this is because we emphasize in the draft that the immutable config uh, flag is used to describe the existing behavior of server. So in order to avoid the uh, logic revert and also to simplify the solution, we have now removed the immutable young extension definition. So now there is a single solution, only the, 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 the metadata notation in the current draft. So it still is a descript descriptive information to annotate the system configuration, which cannot be overridden. And this metadata notation will not be included in service response unless being explicitly asked by the client. The third concern is about the relation of the proposed system data store in system defined configuration work and how, and this immutable mechanism is unclear how, uh, what's the relationship. So we have now add a new session to discuss the relationship between immutable flag and system data store. I think generally the immutable configuration refers to the node instantiated by system yet cannot be overridden by clients. And system configuration always exists. This is regardless of whether the system data store is implemented or not. So immutable configuration uh, is generated in system but does not appear in running until being referenced. And this is on the premise that running needs to be, uh, needs to satisfy the reference, the, the constraints, reference constraints. So immutable configuration being present in running is achieved by either the client copied explicitly or use the resolve system uh, parameter to allow the server to do the copy automatically. And Immutable mechanism allow a server to annotate non-modifiable system configuration uh, with metadata annotation when the configuration is retrieved. This is intended to be uh, backward compatible because a client aware of this annotation can then avoid making unnecessary modification attempts. And so legacy clients do not, do not see any changes and they might encounter errors, might still trying to modify the configuration, but then they will encounter the error response as always. So this is about the, the backward compatible consideration. Okay, I think that's all for my presentation. I think Balaj is first in queue. Go ahead, Balaj. So 
I am very sorry about the state of this, and I was, or I'm mean, one of the authors, but I'm also speaking as a 3GPP delegate. Removing the immutable extension is, is really bad for 3GPP. We know in many cases at design time or, or behind module definition time that some data is immutable, and we are not allowed to put that into the Yang model. Probably we'll have to do a 3GPP so extension for this. It is, yeah. Basically, IETF rejects the 3GPP liaison statement. I'll have to check, do additional checking, but it's a big problem for us. Thank you. Uh, so, Rob Wilton, I'll speak in two points. So, one in terms of the liaison statement, I think that one of the outcome is, uh, and I spoke in, there was a 3GPP IETF liaison coordination meeting, that this working group should send an update back to them once the outcome of this work is to say what parts of their statement we are complying with and, and satisfying and which ones we're not. So, I think that would be good to do. Um, to Balaj's point there, I wonder whether rather than calling it immutable, something like system defined or system controlled configuration might be a different name that might solve that problem. Um, but that's just off the top of my head. I think, um, Shafang, that most of these things you're changing, I think, look better to me. I think this is heading in the right direction. So I think that's good. Uh, I still have the one question just to check is if is it the case ever that if a client writes some configuration to running, it's possible that a delete request to delete the configuration that they've added might ever fail? Or is it always the case that it would always succeed? Sorry, I, I don't... So, so if a client added, it's not possible for a client to add some configuration to running and then the server to say, actually, that's now immutable, and then you try and remove it from running and that to fail for any reason. Is that correct or not correct? No, if, if, if it's the same value, it can add it into running successfully and can also be deleted from running successfully. But, so, but conversely, if you cannot add it to running, then you also cannot delete it from running. Fine. Okay, fine. But it's, it's the stuff that's already there in the system that says you can, you can never change this stuff. It's not you've added some configuration in and now you're like, no, it's now locked. You can never change this. Correct. You don't fine. Have that. Yeah, fine. Okay. Yes. Then I'm, I, then I'm good. If I understand it correctly, that's what's been removed. That was the extension that's removed. I, I thought the extension was just doing it in terms of statically declaring these things. So I think it's slightly different. It was. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to go back, but I thought it was completely. Well, let me go take, read it again. So yeah. So I think that's my conclusion as well, Lou. I need to read the. I need to read the latest version, but it sounds like this is in a better place than it was earlier. So I think it's going in the right direction. Sure. The, Thank you. The immutability of the data is not dependent on any client interaction. It's purely yes. server defined. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have also Italo and myself. Let's see. Okay. Uh, just a quick comment. I think there is no only the GPP other. I know other SDOs have the same issue. So I would prefer the solution to be done by the ITF. Uh, to have, because if you started to use uh, young models from different SDO, if different SDOs have a different solution to represent this will be to be complex. So it's better to have uh, one solution from the ITF uh, with all these issues which are very valid addressed, uh, it will be better than having different SDOs uh, addressing this in a different way. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, the, we, we received a liaison asking the IETF to fix a problem from another SDO. We've had, problem, we've had many times in the past where other SDOs look at IETF technology and say, we're going to change it on our own, and we're not even going to ask you about the technology that you own. So it's unusual, or it's not always the case where another SDO comes to us and says, help us. I personally think we should help them. And this is with any hat, all hats, speaking as chair and as contributor, I think it would be good for us to take a look again at what the request is. The request was not to standardize this document, but was to fix a particular problem and use case. I think it would be good for us as a group to figure out how to do that, rather than tell the other SDOs, go change what you want in our technology. Uh, my opinion, just personal opinion, please. Uh, I heard Balash was uh, 
disappointed that this statement was not in there. I don't think that the statement, the annotation statement itself is a problem. I think we should have it, especially if CBP is, wants it. Sure, that's, that shouldn't be a problem. The, the, the thing that is contentious here is the definitions of what mutable really means and not. And I know that uh, some of the 3GPP work in SA5, which is doing this work, uh, they have traditions in that space that are not compatible completely with Yang. So we cannot say yes to everything. They just adopt the model they have. That wouldn't work. But I think we can provide functionality that is enough for GPP. I hope so. That's my feeling, at least, speaking to Balash earlier. So I think we should try to get to that point. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, the queue is locked, but I'll let Balaj come in uh, just because we need to get his response to that. Yeah, we need to. So uh, we are 3GPP asked for two things. One was the the restricted thing, where you only allow, you are only allowed to set set a value when, let's say, the encompassing list list is created, and not change it later. That's Wow. Yeah, that's more problematic. But this that I already know at Yang model design time that this or that part will never or should never be changed. We really don't understand why that is a problem. Yes, you will have two mechanisms because for some of the things you know it in design time or in, that it's immutable. But if you have that information at design time, why not share it in the Yang model? And why not share it with, I don't know, OSS integrators or SMO integrators? Why do we have to wait for that information to be available only in runtime? Whole Yang is on the based on the principle that we know a lot about our models. We document it before runtime, already in design time. So I really don't understand why the extension needs to be removed. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next presentation. And Scott, if you can make it quick. Absolutely. Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, Scott Mansfield, affiliated with Ericsson. So this is a uh, draft that I'm really here just to ask the chairs what to do. Because we have in CCAMP, you'll notice this is something that we've been doing in CCAMP. There was a um, draft that was called, uh, That's it's still in a draft, it's the microwave topology graph. There were two other modules inside of that draft. One was called the interface reference um, module. And all it did was it, it allowed you to hook together an endpoint in a topology to the interface that it was supporting. And so we said, well, this isn't really a microwave thing. So would it be possible to progress this work somewhere else other than just CCAMP? So um, CCAMP is willing to give it up. If you want it to be done in CCAMP, we can continue to do that. But I brought it here because this is the group that seems like it would be a place to put this kind of extension. And so what I've done here is just provided the GitHub and the draft link and go to the next page. And it's basically the ask. Oh, I can go to the next page. And so, so we're asking, what do we do? Thanks. Uh, I, I see Olga's in queue. I'll let Olga go first. Thank you, Olga Havel Huawei. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, this is exactly what I was thinking also before when I saw this draft, you know, because uh, what we also did for the evaluation of RFC 3454, uh, perhaps for the digital map, we identified, you know, connecting right. uh, mm -hmm. old topology entities to different things like either interface or configurations or inventory or, you know, different things. So we identified it as a requirement from the customers, it verified with operators, and it is something that we are kind of planning to look at, but in a very generic way in terms of being supported for interface, but also for all the other things for that are there. So at the moment, uh, things that are related to topology, we have few things like uh, Oscar's draft that were not in the ops, but they were moved to ops, and we have this draft in ops, and also Nigel's draft, which is uh, proposing some extensions to RFC 8345 to address some limitations that right. we found. So my recommendation would be to, to join the right. 
Thanks. So, Kent as chair, and uh, to answer your question, what to do with the document, um, we were looking at this before the, the meeting, and uh, our understanding is that there's a new working group called the Inventory Working Group, which Thanks, is chair. focusing on topology. And uh, I think, I'm, I'm not sure we have actually the, one of the chairs of that working group in the, in the room right now. And uh, if, it, if there's anything that can be said there, but it, that might be a place to take it. I, it I, NetMod I, is okay. obviously the, the, the catch all, um, but if there is a better working group, that'd be good for us. Okay. Yeah. Good. I, I think that's the right way to, to phrase it is we're the, we're the catch all when there's not another working group to, to do it. So that one's a, work, a candidate you know, routing working group boys likes taking things, oh, CCAMP, yeah. any, any of those are good candidates. If you can't find elsewhere, then come here. So or hop on the, various mailing lists and ask, hey, do you want this one? Well, actually, maybe we can get our AD who's standing, going to the mic ah. to help, uh, <laughs> yeah. help so, direct yes. that. Perfect. Yeah, we, we do have a new working group called Ivy. And one of the working group objective is to define uh, the correlation between the network inventory and the network topology. And I, I do think there might be some relation between this work and I think might be good for this work to be discussed in IV. And okay. if some co correlation might uh, be good if among different- So I know concepts. what to do for Australia then, thank you. <laughs> Mine's not technical, so I'll, I'll jump in. So, uh, yes, I will help you find the right home for this. I don't Perfect. know whether Ivy is the right home or not, but yes, I will help you Somewhere. find the right place. Thanks. Uh, Bo, uh, here I have some questions. I have two comments. One is that uh, I noticed your model is a network model, but you you adding the interface name as a diff reference, but I, I think from the network... I'm Why? sorry, I'm going to have to cut the queue. Yeah. Uh, this is too detailed of a question. We're running out of time. Okay. Can we take it to the list? Yeah, take yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. that'd be okay. great. Uh, Jan, you have the last presentation. Okay, so here's some more work that's looking for a home. Um, we'll see where you, where you think it fits. So uh, recently, I've been starting to work with uh, Yang-based time series telemetry. Um, I'm a climate buff, so I want to measure power and energy and stuff like that from devices. But as part of that work, uh, as part of that work, we realized that there was something that was um, collecting telemetry data is something that's been done a lot already, and there's a lot of of work in that space that could be generic, that not associated with sustainability at all. This uh, little box at the end there is supposed to be a check mark because uh, you have probably seen, uh, just as I have seen, lots of graphs with telemetry data coming from devices. It could be packets and bytes, or it could be uh, power, uh, uh, kilowatt hours, or whatever it is. But you have seen lots of these graphs. And so we have Yang based devices that are producing graphs. So check, we are there, aren't we? Well, I, I say we are not. We get the really nice graphs, definitely, but what do they mean? I mean, when I ask uh, people about these graphs uh, that I've seen, um, so is the cooling cost included in this value? Um, people don't know, because there's no way to trace this back, this, all this aggregated data, trace it back to where does it come from, what's included, the definition of this is what unit is it? Is it the real or reactive power? There's just no way of knowing what we have measured. This is done in a ad hoc way without solid foundations. So I think we need a sort of framework, a base foundation for how we collect this data and uh, aggregate it. And so that we keep all this metadata about what we are measuring. And I think maybe NetMod would be a good place for that framework, the generic collection framework when it comes to time series data. We are going to use this data for making decisions. So then it's quite important. I mean, having a nice graph is impressive in a customer demo, but uh, when you're making decisions, you need the data to be as reasonably accurate. Should you move this traffic from here to here or, or not? So here's the philatelist framework. It's all about collecting stamps or time stamp data, right? 
so we have provider devices on the bottom. We have collectors, we have aggregators. And the, the thing with uh, coming here is not that we, I want to standardize the implementation anyway, but I want to define APIs around these, these uh, levels or these roles in the collection framework. And I want everything to be based on Yang. I mean, obviously lots of devices out there do not have Yang interfaces at all. It's a CPU rack, they have no Yang models. It's a cooling system, there's no Yang module for that. But in that case, I want the collector level to add Yang modules so that we have clear definitions of what we are measuring at all levels and metadata for it. And uh, then uh, we have this, these providers that are either Yang based or non Yang based. And then we are either getting Yang models from the source or we are adding it on the way before it lands in a time series database called destination here. And then we have the aggregators which are reading and uh, applying some sort of transformation of this, either aggregation, uh, just adding a time series linear averages or summing things up or maybe doing more complex transforms on the data on the way in and storing it to yet another destination. But part of this is uh, you have Yang model data and you're storing it in the time series database and time series databases, they don't have this Yang structure of data. And if you don't uh, pay attention, you lose track of what you are actually seeing up in the time search database. So uh, Christian Larsson uh, at uh, Deutsche Telekom, I'm presenting this on behalf of him, uh, came up with a mapping where you take Yang uh, instance identifiers or Yang paths and produce a name that is usable in a time search database context so that you have uh, the names are basically concatenations of the path with slashes replaced by underscore and all the keys re replaced by what's called labels in many of these time series database systems. So uh, we call this a mapping, it's not a transport. I mean, you can take Yang and see how things are encoded in XML or JSON and so on, CBOR. But uh, this is only taking, this is only about finding out how you map data from in the, in the Yang context into something that makes sense in a time series database. And we want the Yang described everywhere so we have something to reason about when it comes to what we are measuring. Uh, we think this can scale very well and we have some <coughs> implementations of this. Uh, and uh, it, it looks like this when you go to the time series database side that you can use the influx QL or prompt QL uh, languages to select from and then you see what you're actually talking about here. The fish map back all the way to the end. So we think that uh, this framework part could maybe land here in that mode or at that is my hypothesis so far. Whereas this uh, mapping part is maybe more a netconf uh, topic. And then we have <laughs> things that uh, the sustainability parts of this that go elsewhere. I don't know exactly where you are. Okay, so you've expertly uh, uh, preempted my question <laughs> 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 because uh, the same presentation was just given in netconf and uh, the, the draft names expertly um, uh, don't provide which working group they're supposed to be targeting. And that was going to be my question, uh, which working group. Uh, so you're thinking of splitting the work. Some of the work would be in NetMod and some of the work would be in NetConf. That's my intuition that this okay. uh, sort of mapping from Yang into some sort of, <clears throat> it's not exactly a transport protocol, but into something that makes sense in another world. That's more a NetConf thing. I, that's my feeling. Okay. And this sort of general framework for collecting metadata would be maybe more here. And then the applications that are actually doing things with this would be, I don't know, if maybe IV or Opsize or something. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you for interesting new work and anticipating the question we had for you. So that was awesome. Um, uh, we really appreciate all the good discussion and input. Uh, we do think uh, it's going to be important to have some offline discussions on where do we go on some of the issues with uh, uh, versioning and also uh, flag system it, config. yeah system config was the one I was really thinking of but yeah mutable flags sounds like there's a proposal on how to move forward for the document but not so much for uh, the liaison um, so we definitely want to go back to the liaison 
uh, see what the solutions are that we have and see how we're lining up. And maybe we, Bilaj, we can have some offline conversations as well. Uh, thank you all for a very good session. Thank you. And uh, even though it's only Tuesday, we'll see, from well, a Manetnamon <laughs> standpoint, we'll see you at the next ITF. Or if those who are going to the dinner tonight, uh, hopefully everyone in the room saw Rob's invite and signed up for that. So if you're there, I'll see you there. See you then. Button. I know this thing is No, not especially. The point is that there are <coughs> that in fact the, the original because by the normative 